If you have your Bible with you this morning, we're turning to uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, and Isaiah 57, then we're going over into the New Testament, to the little book of James. Isaiah 57, please, in just one verse of Scripture, a well-known verse often quoted in the Gospel, Isaiah 57 and verse 15. And let us just still ourselves in the presence of the Lord this morning. And if you have a phone, turn it off. And if you have a child and you feel that they're going to uh, be difficult with you, you just take them out whenever you feel that you have to. We're not making you, making you do that, but the facility's there if you, if you feel that you have to take them out. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. For thus saith the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place, with him also of a contrite and a humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I want you to come over then to the book of James, almost at the end of your New Testament, just after the book of Hebrews, and you'll come to the little epistle of James. And to chapter 4, please. James chapter 4, and commencing to read together at verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. And let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Just one final reading, please, in the First Peter chapter 5. Just turn over. And you'll come into the epistle of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, and down to verse 5, and we're just breaking in at the middle of the verse. 1 Peter chapter 5, and in the middle of verse 5, we read, For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might, or that he may, Exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And we know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Father, we just bow before thee again, and we just ask for your help this morning. We come against every spirit, Lord, that would seek to hinder in this gathering, and we come against it in Jesus' name. And we come claiming that precious blood and the authority that is there. And we pray, Lord, that you will just settle us, your people, in your presence. We pray that you will give us ears to hear what you will have to say to every single one of us this morning. We take authority over the enemy. We submit ourselves unto God and we resist the devil in Jesus' name. And we pray that you will put a hedge, Lord, over this meeting this morning. We pray that you will change the very atmosphere of this meeting. We pray that you will come in thy cleansing, sanctifying power. And we pray in Jesus' name, that name of the victorious Son of God, that you will come, Lord, and minister into our hearts. Father, I need your help, and we pray that you will just come now and fill us afresh with thy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A conversation that I had during the week with an individual concerning the things of God We were talking about how in every generation, whenever men or women of God rediscovered some truth within the Scriptures, there was always a manifestation of God. It was whenever Luther rediscovered justification by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, that there was a move of God that turned Europe back to God. Whenever Wesley came and discovered the mighty truth of sanctification by the Spirit, 
Whenever the covenanters came and they reclaimed again that the Lord Jesus Christ was the king of the church. And you could go through the centuries of time, the Anabaptists, and down through the ages of the church and the, the brethren all discovering mighty truth. And whenever that truth was rediscovered that lay dormant in the word of God, Every time that happened, God came and moved in mighty blessing. The question that I asked myself that night whenever I went home and lay in bed was, Lord, what do we need to rediscover in this our day? What do you and I as the people of God in this generation that know all about what Wesley rediscovered, we all know the truth about baptism. We all know the truth of what the covenanters held to and what Luther brought out of the Scripture. But what do you and I, as the people of God, in 2022, what truth would we need to rediscover in order to see a manifestation of God? After praying over that question, the answer that I came to is the same answer this morning. It's found over 4,000 times in your Bible. I can tell you, dear men and women, this morning, as the people of God, what we need to rediscover is God. God. We've got so used to talking about God. So often we think Him to be some distant figure in a faraway sphere. Someone that is looking down through the clouds, watching the occasional action. Recording the occasional word. When my Bible tells me that God is the one who knows all things, who sees all things, and he upholds all things by the very word of his power. Whenever the Lord Jesus stood and looked into the eyes of the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, he had to turn to her and say, Ye worship, ye know not what. I can tell you, dear friends, this morning, many of us even in this hall today, we worship a God of our own making. And we read the truth of the Scripture and we pull lovely attributes together. And we can make a God of our own ideas and our own ideology. But whenever you and I, as the people of God, get back to the God of the Bible, Elohim, El Shaddai, the God who donates to his people his power. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide. And on and on we could go to rediscover God. I can tell you, dear men and women, this morning, in a measure, God has withdrawn himself from us. In a measure, God seems to be at a distance from you and I, his people. But whenever we get alone with him and get intimate with him and say, Oh God, reveal yourself to me. And like Moses, the man that was mightily used, he came face to face with God. What an awesome thing for a man or woman to come face to face with God. I think we would need to rediscover the person that he is. The mighty attributes that he has, his his sovereignty, his power, his ability, his authority. We would need to rediscover not only the person that he is, we would need to rediscover something of the power that he has. We would need to rediscover something of the promises that he's made. Because all the promises of God are in Christ. Yea and amen. But this is what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I can tell you, dear men and women, this message has burned in my heart like no other message I have ever preached. Because God has smitten me in his presence. Because we not only need to rediscover the power that he has and the person that he is and the promises that he's made, I tell you, dear friends, this morning, we need to rediscover something of the principles that he looks for. Because God looks for principles in your life and mine. And if you're saved this morning and going on with the Lord, there's attributes in your life and mine that God is looking for every moment of the day. One of the mighty attributes and one of the mighty principles that he looks for among his people is purity. To be a pure people. 
I can tell you, dear friends, this morning the Bible said and the Lord Jesus said that the pure in heart shall see God. And whenever you and I as the people of God get to the place in our life where we no longer flirt with sin, where we no longer have a small standard of sin, when we see sin in the sight of a holy God and we see who he is and say, Oh God, give me clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands are manward. A pure heart is Godward. And that's what the Lord is looking for in you and I, his people, that we would be clean in the things that we say clean in the things that we do, clean in the things that we think. I can say this morning, my dear people, the people of God have never been as polluted as they are today. You just have to read through the papers of the past week to see men that profess to walk with God, doing things that the even ungodly wouldn't do. And sin has crept in among us. And we look at the prostitute and we look at the drug addict and we look at the gambler and we look at the man who commits immorality and we point the finger at them and we, we gaze upon them and we even gossip them about them. But whenever you and I get into the pure, unadulterated presence of a holy God, I would say, preacher included, every one of us will say, woe is me, for I am undone. To get into the presence of the Almighty, that word holy in the scriptures is an old Hebrew word. It means to cut. You ever see a butcher in a butcher's shop and he gets the cleaver and he cuts the meat? There's a separation. I can tell you, dear friends, this morning, from Adam was called in the garden and whenever Abraham called, was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, God wants his people to be separated, a different people. Whenever God saved us, I can tell you, he called us out called us out of darkness into light. And you and I as the people of God, a principle that he is looking for is that we would be a different people. I don't want to be like the world. I don't want to go where the world goes. I don't want to talk about what the world talks about. I want to be different. I want to be set apart for God. That was the problem with Samson. That was the problem with Lot. That was the problem with Demas. They live too close to the world. And so many of us, we live and we flirt with the world. And we spend more time with the world and we watch the world and we talk like the world and we dress like the world. And then on a Sunday, we come together and say, Oh God, bless me. But he's not only looking for purity among his people, he's looking for unity among his people. In Psalm 133, blessed, blessed I can tell you it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. Whenever there's that harmony and that fellowship together. Like those men that were in the boat, the word fellowship, fellows in a ship, all pulling together, all rowing in the same direction, all pulling with the same weight, all taking their little place in the boat and putting their shoulder to the work. Twelve times in the book of Acts, you'll get that little phrase, they were in one accord. Can I ask you a question this morning? Are you in one accord? Are you in one accord with other believers in this assembly? Are you and I in unity? And whenever David was thinking, he saw in his mind the high priest going into the Holy of Holies. And there he had the mitre upon his head and on his breastplate he had the twelve stones representing the people of God. And whenever he was anointed with the oil, the oil came over his head, down his beard, over the breastplate. And those twelve stones were united in the presence of God. And I tell you, dear friends, this morning, and whenever you and I get as a people that are pure, marked by purity and unity, and we're all striving together, seeking to lay hold of God for souls, seeking to pray together, seeking to live together in harmony one with another. That's what God was looking for in the church at Corinth. They were the most gifted church in all of the New Testament, and yet they were the most divided. God had blessed them with speaking in tongues and miracles and all the mighty gifts of the Spirit. But whenever Paul the Apostle took his pen, he said, there is division among you and ye walk as men. I can tell you, dear friends, this morning, 
Whenever God takes his scalpel and he puts it right into your heart, maybe a brother or sister that you can't talk to, you maybe talk about them but wouldn't talk to them. Whenever there's a brother or sister and we'd rather avoid them than talk to them, or we'd maybe go out the back door, or we, we have this negativity in our heart against them every time that they maybe pray, we, we, we question them every time they do something, we, we ridicule them. And every time there's a positive thing in their life, we always try to bring the negative, always try to oppress them, always try to degrade them, always try to put them down. Have you ever been guilty of that? Put your hand up this morning. Well, I'll put my hand up. I can tell you, dear friends, whenever God gets his people pure, whenever God gets us marked by unity, but this is what I'm after this morning, because it's not only a matter of being marked by unity and purity. One of the great things that God looks for in you and I, and oh, how he has smitten me, is that awesome word, humility. Humility. Humility, the missing jewel of the church today. I hear of revival conferences and I go to them. I've heard of conferences on, on prophecy and I go to them. But I have never heard of a conference on humility. Where we get sackcloth and ashes, where we eat the bread of affliction and we mourn in the presence of a holy God. Where we bow low before him. I can tell you, dear friends, this morning, that's what God requires in you and I, his people, to be a humble people. The first attribute that the Lord Jesus talked about in the Sermon of the Mount, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, to be marked by humility. It was J.C. Ryle said, no sin is so deeply rooted in the human nature and cleaves to us like our skin covers us than the sin of pride. Thomas Manson said this, pride is the root of all sin, the mother of contempt against God. I can say, oh, as I have been before the Lord, you know what God has been saying to me? Stephen, you're full of pride. I'll tell you that this morning. Whenever I see myself in the light of a holy God, Whenever I see and discover what he thinks of me, whenever he opens my heart and looks down into the deep recesses of my being, oh my God, show me what you see and what he's seen in me is, Stephen, you're full of pride. I wonder would he have the same diagnosis of many of us here this morning. It was pride that brought Satan from heaven. Lucifer, the son of the morning, the most beautiful being that God ever created. And Lucifer, it says that his heart was lifted up. Look at me. Hear me. See me. Acknowledge me. Appreciate me. Praise me. And it was lifted up onto his own destruction. He wanted position because he said, I will ascend into heaven. He wanted power for he said, I will be like the most high. He wanted the preeminence, for he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And he wanted praise. I tell you, my dear men and women, does that touch a nerve with any of us here today? Want the preeminence. Give me the position in the church, Lord. Give me the pulpit, Lord. Give me some area of ministry that people can see me. That was the very mentality of Satan. It's going to be the very mentality of the Antichrist whenever he comes. Read about him in 2 Thessalonians. And God could say of Satan, this being that was marked by perfection, marked by beauty, marked by wisdom, this is what God said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cast down? And I can say to your men and women this morning, God hates pride. He hates it. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says of Sodom and Gomorrah in Ezekiel chapter 16 that she was marked by pride and haughtiness and fullness of bread and abundance of idleness. 
And the reason why God came from heaven was not only because of immorality and not only because of sodomy. The reason why God came, he says, I took them away because they were haughty. Oh, my dear men and women, I want to try and burn this into your heart. It's all right pointing at the world. But whenever you and I get into the presence of a holy God and say, Lord, am I full of pride? Do I want position? Do I want praise? Do I want power? I can tell you this morning, if you're not saved, it'll be most likely pride that'll take you to a lost eternity. Because the world this morning is filled with men and women who want to do it their own way. And like Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, he, he worshipped himself and he built a statue six, 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 sixty cubits high, six cubits wide, six trumpets blue, six, 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 the number of man. And he wanted everybody to worship him. And in Daniel chapter 4, God humbled him. And his hair became like the feathers of an eagle. And his claws, his nails like the claws of a bird. He ate grass like an ox. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar, old ungodly man that he was, he that walketh in pride, God will surely abase. And here was a man with all of his pride and with all of his arrogance came to the place in his life where he said, Lord, it's me. It's me. But it's not the pride of Satan. And it's not the pride of Sodom. And it's not the pride of sinners that God's after today. I want to tell you what it is. It's the pride of the saints. Pride. Full of pride. And I put myself before every one of you this morning. I get off this pulpit and I sit down beside our brother, Barry, and I say, Stephen, preach to me today. You remember David? the mighty man of God, the sweet psalmist of Israel, and coming on to the end of his ministry, he sent Joe about among the people of God to number the people. And David's heart was lifted up with pride. He was intoxicated by numbers. You know, every time a preacher rings me, you know what they ask me, how's the numbers at the lifeboat? My dear men and women, God is not interested in numbers. God is interested in spirituality. And David here, his heart was swelled up with pride because of numbers. And over 50,000 or 70,000 men died in the presence of God because of one man's pride. What about Uzziah? Mighty king that he was. And it says of Uzziah that he was marvelously helped of the Lord until he became strong. He could do it himself. And then Uzziah's heart was lifted up with pride and one day he walked through the inner court of the temple and was going to go into the very holy of holies. It took over 80 men to restrain him. He was so determined to come into the presence of God intoxicated with self-importance and pride. And as he stood, God smote him with leprosy because God hates pride. And then there's a man by the name of Uzzah, and Uzzah saw the Ark of the Covenant that lay in his house for 20 years, and he got so familiar with the things of God, and whenever the Ark, it, it rocked on the cart, Uzzah put forth his hand, and he touched the glory. Oh, my dear friends, God will not send us revival if we're going to touch the glory. He'll not do it. What about the church of Laodicea? The church of Laodicea, that church that marks the last church age of this dispensation. They were rich and increased with goods and were in need of nothing. They didn't even need God. Could you believe that? A church, an apostolic church, had actually got to the place where they didn't need God. And the Lord says that you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art poor, miserable, naked, wretched, and blind. You know, it took God to put this in my heart the other morning, how it broke me. You never read of the Lord Jesus being sick in all of the Gospels. Whenever he stood at the grave of Lazarus and Martha said, Lord, he stinks. Did you ever smell a dead body? Were you ever walking through the town and you smelt a, a lorry taking the dead cattle maybe to the abitur? Or going to be cremated? And the smell is obnoxious. And here is Lazarus lying four days in the grave in the heat of the sun. 
And Martha says, Lord, he stinks. But it didn't make him sick. It didn't even make the Lord sick whenever he saw the lepers come and ten of them. Their fingers were all degrading and their ears probably were falling off and their nose were all eaten away, gangrene. The smell of it must have been awful. It would have been bad enough for one, but for ten. And here the Lord Jesus stands and he, did, he wasn't sick that day. I would have been sick. He wasn't sick whenever he saw the demonic of Gadara coming with, with scars on his body and the blood was maybe even oozing out of him with chains around him. And here was a man, demon-possessed. His life was ruined. But the Lord Jesus wasn't sick that day. And the thing that God has smote my heart was, oh, Stephen, I wasn't sick at the leper and I wasn't sick at death and I wasn't sick at disease. But it's possible for you and I as the people of God to make our blessed Savior sick. Think of that. The one who wept and the one who shed tears and the one who cried. The one who's in heaven at this very moment, the King of Kings, the potentate of time. To think that I, Stephen Riddle, in 2022 could be so filled with self-importance and pride and be so obnoxious to him that he says, Stephen, you're going to make me sick. To be overcome. To stink in the presence of a holy God. And you get your concordance whenever you go home and take that word abomination. That word abomination is the word abhorrent. It's the word disgusting and it's the word vile. My dear friends, that's strong language. The Lord Jesus could say and God could say of sodomy that it's, it's abominable. He could say that of adultery and idolatry. He could say that of dishonesty. And whenever you and I are dishonest in our business, it's just as abominable as sodomy. That's what God says. But five times in the Bible, more than sodomy and more than dishonesty, five times God says that pride is an abomination to me. Five times. I'll tell you what God laid in my heart now. And this is, you can take this from the Lord. The Gay Pride Parade is in Belfast once a year. It was in Oma yesterday, but it'll only be once a year. They come to Cookstown once a year. But I wonder over how many of our churches is there a Pride Parade every Sunday morning. Hmm. Hmm. Whenever we think we've all got it right, and maybe some other wee man and he's only saved out of drink or drugs and we would almost put him down. And we would belittle him or laugh at him because he uses maybe a different version or whatever you want to put in there. Maybe because people dress different or say different words than what we do. And we're all so good at making a diagnosis. There was a woman came into this prayer meeting a year ago and I looked at her and I said, God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And you know, then she began to pray. I can tell you, dear men and women, I went home and I got all I could say was, God forgive me. God forgive me. And here was Stephen Riddle and so many of us, we ticked the boxes. And we judged by appearance and we judged by what they say or where they go. And God says it's pride because the center letter of pride is I, P-R-I-D. And whenever you and I as the people of God get humble enough before him and low enough before him, I was in the presence of two preachers the other night and one of the preachers said this to me. Stephen, you know I used to say to a brother whenever he's getting onto the pulpit, I'll be praying for you in the pew. I hope you do well. And then he turned around to me and says, Stephen, you know whenever that preacher would make a mistake, it was almost praising God. And preachers envy preachers and singers envy singers. And elders envy elders and deacons envy de deacons and Christians envy Christians. And the center letter of pride, I say again, is that little word I. Oh, I want to outpray him. I want to outdo him. I want to outgive them. Oh, Lord, give me a place where people can see me. Have you ever done it? Put your hand up there. Be honest before we go. Put your hand up. Well, there's one here. A few of you. 
A.W. Tozer said the greatest sin in the church today and the most serious thing is the pride of subtlety of orthodox living. To be orthodox in all that we do and yet be without God. The church at Laodicea was the only church where Jesus Christ was still being worshipped and he was outside the door. And here they were, oh, they had everything. They had all right and all of the things in the right place. But the most important person was not even there. And they didn't know it. Hmm. You may be watching the king yesterday. And whenever Charles, he signed a piece of paper and they came out and there was men there and there was their trumpets and the soldiers had their big hats. And I read it on the internet. One reporter said, the day of great pomp. Oh, I tell you, dear men and women, whenever we get low before God and we say, Lord, we seem to have everything but you. Whenever we say, Lord, we've got the buildings and we've got the congregation and we've got the preachers and we've got our finances. But whenever we get low before a holy God and say, turn again our captivity, cause thy face to shine upon us and we shall be saved. Is that why our quiet times are barren? Is that why our missions and our outreaches see no fruit? Is that why we have no praise in our heart because God has been dethroned in our life and I sits upon the place of preeminence and yet we worship him with our mouth but our hearts are far from him. More jealousy and envy and strife in the church today than there's ever been. More division. And there's more pride. And I can tell you, whenever Nehemiah came back from captivity and he saw the walls of Jerusalem and the gates had been burned with fire and he began to weep and the prayer of Jeremiah, read it tonight on your knees beside your bed, time after time again, this is what he had to turn to. Oh God, thy people are proud. And Nehemiah discovered that the destruction of Jerusalem was all down to the pride of his people. Not the sodomites. Not abortion. Not Trump. Not Boris Johnson. Not the witches' covens. Not the charms. But the people of God. And here Nehemiah got down before God and I say to you this morning, dear people, it's time for you and I to be humble ourselves in the presence of God. And that's why I read those two passages in James and in 1 Peter. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he shall lift you up to get low before him. For God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. That word resist is the word oppose. You know, my dear people, I don't want to be involved in the work of God and stand up here and prepare hours and sermons and pray and after it all, God still to be against me. I don't want that. I don't want to be in assembly. I don't want to be in the church of God in Northern Ireland with all of our activity and yet for him to be against us. For if God be against us, who can be for us? And the one key of it all is to bow low before God. And the Lord Jesus said, For whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humility is a word that the Greeks didn't even they didn't have a word to translate the word humility. The Greeks were always about pushing yourself forward and getting position, always about striving for the best, make yourself notice. And most scholars believe that it was actually Paul that penned the word humility. And that word humility, let me describe it to you for a moment. It means simply this, to get down. It's like the barley in the field under the wind, the bend low. It's a word to take the low position. It's an old Latin word where we get our word from today to get below the ground. And that's why the old Jews, whenever they come into the presence of God, they put dust on their head to get under the ground. And they put away all of their great clothes and they had sackcloth and ashes. And they wept and they mourned before God and said, Lord, the nation has turned from you. Our children are going to hell. Our families, Lord, the devil has wrecked them. Oh, God, we bow low before you. 
And they humbled themselves in the presence of a holy God. And they bent down before him. The old Puritans used to say, the door into heaven is low. Stoop. Stoop. Oh, don't get on the pedestal this morning. And whether you're a Sunday school teacher or a Friday night worker or another person in this church and you, you want position, give me position. Give me the central row. Oh, get, get me into the place where people listen to me and people obey me. Oh, my dear men and women. To bow low before a holy God. You know, one of the lovely studies in the Bible is whenever God was in the midst but there's one time in the Scriptures in the New Testament whenever the Lord Jesus did not take the central position. In Luke's, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, this is what he said. He called a little child and set him in the midst. And for the first time, the Lord Jesus got out of the central position. You know why? Because he could trust that little child. He knew that child wasn't going to take the praise. He knew that little innocent child had no guile or no deception. And the Lord Jesus set the child in the midst. And he says, except ye become as little children. And humble yourselves in the presence of a holy God. I tell you, dear men and women, is God sticking his finger into you? As I can tell you, he stuck his knife into me. Pride. There's only one way to deal with pride. And that is by coming to the cross of Jesus Christ. If you get an eye and you draw a line through the middle of it, you'll have the cross. And how you and I will deal with that old pride nature, me, bless me, help me, oh, give me opportunity. I tell you, whenever you and I come to the cross and see the Lord Jesus there, and we not only stand at the cross, but then we get on the cross. And Paul could say, oh, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. I was crossed out. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me in the life that I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, I die daily. And maybe there was a day in your life whenever you did do business with God and you got on the altar, but you're not there now. Die daily. To stick the knife into pride every day. To die before the Lord and before the Lord Jesus said, come and dine. He said, come and die. Did you ever die? Did you ever die? Did you ever get alone with God and say, Lord, I'm glad you went to the cross, but now it's my turn. And you're not going to get any eulogies and you're not going to be noticed by men and you get onto the cross and you say, Lord, from this moment I'm dead. Not my ambitions, not my desires, not my praise, Lord. Not me in the central role. Lord, just kill me. Take me out of the way. And that's what John the Baptist could say. He must increase and I must decrease. For the axe to be laid to the root of the tree and all the sin in our lives, I can tell you, it all goes back to pride. Why did you commit adultery? Oh, I wanted to. Why did you tell lies? Well, I wanted to. And pride, the, the, the eye at the center of it all, oh, to get alone and die. And if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will heal their sin and heal the land. And a broken and a contrite heart, he'll not despise it. And my dear men and women, there used to be the old game the young people used to play years ago. How low can you go? Hmm. How low can we go? How low to get before a holy God and put the dust on our head and to get down in the presence of a holy God and to bow before him. Now you may be say to me as I close, Stephen, what does this humility look like? Stephen, I want to be humble and I want God, God to do a work in my life. I want to be marked by this mighty attribute of humility. And I can feel in my own life, Stephen, that you're identifying with me. I feel that I have the preeminence. I want to be noticed. I want to have the central place. Stephen, how do I deal with it? Well, I'll tell you how you deal with it. It's not only get on the cross, but gaze upon the Lord Jesus. Because the Lord Jesus was the embodiment of humility. 
Because though he was equal with God, he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross, the sinless Lamb of God, stepped from the praises and the beauty of heaven into the, into the darkness of a virgin's womb. Laid and wrapped in swaddling clothes, he was born in humility. He lived in humility. My, he was the carpenter's son. Lived in the sin capital of Israel, Nazareth. Was described as a worm and as a root and no man. And it says that he was made even lower than the angels. And humility is just to be Christ-like. Just to be like the master. And a man said to me in England the other week, he said, Stephen, so many of us, we name him. But so few of us look like him. Hmm. So many of us, we sing about him, but very few of us look like him. And whenever you and I are marked by humility of the master, it'll be a humility of service. Because the Lord Jesus took the servant's robe and he was found in fashion as a man and he humbled himself. And you remember in John 13, the night before he was crucified, and whenever his friends were going to forsake him and Judas was going to deny him, and it says after they had supped, then the Lord Jesus rising and taking off his garment, he took it off, I had loved to have seen him, laying aside those lovely garments that he had, and it says that he lifted a towel and he got a basin and he got water and he girded the towel around him and he got down at the disciples' feet and he took their sandals off and he would have looked at Peter and he knew Peter was going to deny him, but he still washed his feet. He knew Thomas was going to doubt him. And here the Lord Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, with a, a slave's rag around him, just an old servant's gown, got down and he began to wash the feet of Thomas. One after another, he took the sandals and got onto their feet and washed them. And then it says that he dried them with the towel. And he took the low place. And I was thinking this morning, what would happen if we were just to announce some Sunday morning here that we're going to have a feet washing service? Hmm. And you're not going to have hymn books and you're not going to be given any great eulogies, but you'll give a, a bottle of water each in the basin and a weak cloth and we would all go around one another and wash our feet. Well, I'm not going to do that, Stephen. I don't mind singing now, but I'm not going to do that. And here the Lord Jesus got down. Got down and one after another he washed their feet. And then he said this, So ought ye to do to one another. One another. Some of you sisters here, would you wash another sister's feet here today? Would I? And never the Lord Jesus got down. And he had the servant's hand. And he had a sacrificial heart and he had a submissive will for he said, not my will, but thine be done. You see, the language of the proud is this, my will. The language of humility is thy will. Now, just let me say something before I close. Some of you dear people here and we love you. And we pray for you. And we want to help you the best that we can. But you know, there's some of you here and you don't obey the word of God. Whether at the table or baptism, whatever it may be, whatever area of your life. My dear men and women, I, Stephen Riddle has come to the place in his minister. I'm not going to push you anymore. I'm not going to push you into the prayer meeting. I'm not even going to push you around the table. Because I could stand here and say you must do it and you need to do it and you could do it just to be seen. All I'll say is this. The reason why you don't do it is because of pride. I don't want to do that. I'll do everything else. I'll do my will, Lord, but not thy will. And here the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, after washing their feet with great drops of blood, as it were, sweating out of his body, and being in agony. And there the angel had to come and strengthen him. He came to the place and said, Lord, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. 
And is it any but wonder that the father could say, Behold my servant, he shall not fail. He was marked by humility, and oh, the way to go up is the way to go down. The way to live is to die, and the way to be great is to be the least, and the way to be the master is to be the servant. We hear a lot today about gifts. And I believe in all the gifts, by the way. But I don't hear anybody praying in the prayer meeting, Lord, give me the gift of health. Oh, I hear people saying, Lord, give me the gift of healing and give me the gift of miracles. But I never hear anybody in putting myself there saying, Lord, give me the gift of help, just to help somebody. And whenever Gideon was going down into the battle against Moab and against the Midianites, the Lord said to Gideon, he says, Gideon, if you're afraid to go, take a man with you. He's only mentioned once in your Bible, and he's a name Führer. And he just helped Gideon that day. I can tell you, dear men and women, in my little study in 85 Trudex Road, how God has turned tonight. He has turned tonight. You know, you say to me, Stephen, if I do humble myself, what will I get? Well, I can tell you what you'll get. You'll get help because it says that he giveth grace unto the humble. And he'll hear you because he says, if my people which are called by my name humble themselves and seek my face and pray, then will I hear from heaven. And in Isaiah 57, and verse 15, he says, I have come to revive the heart of the humble. Would there be a prayed parade here today? Well, my dear men and women, let us come before the king. And thank God he'll not beat us. Thank God he'll not make a fool of us. Thank God he's not going to take the stick. But if we come and say, Lord, I pray that you make your son real in me. Make me a Christian, Lord, where Christ is in me. I want to be like the master. I can tell you he'll do it. And Paul says that you would prefer one another. And that really means this in the old English translation. Try to out humility. Be more humble than anyone else. I wonder, would you go home from this meeting and say, Lord, I'm going to make that my goal. I want to be more like Christ than ever before. Christ in the marriage. Christ in the church. Christ at work. Where I take the low place before God and we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. He will lift us up. Let us pray. We can help you anyway, dear men and women. We'll do that. We're here to help you. We're here to serve you. But I believe this is the key. I believe that's the key in many of our lives, just to get low before God. I believe it's the key to answered prayer. I believe it's the key to revival. And I believe it's even the key in this assembly. That if we can come and say, Lord, create your son in me. We're just going to bow in a moment of prayer and then our meeting is over, and if you're leaving this morning, just go out as quietly as you can. And then we're going to gather around the table and remember the most humble person that ever was. What a stoop. What a step. Father, we bow before thee. Lord, how we feel small in your presence. And how, Lord, you've been dealing with our own heart. And we believe even this morning you've been putting areas, Lord, in our lives before thee. We pray in Jesus' precious and worthy name that you will come, Lord. And we will walk as the Son of God walked. We pray that we will be marked by the servant's hand and the submissive heart and the sacrificial will. When we think of the one who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and made himself of no reputation, and there he was found in fashion as a man and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we pray this morning if there's believers in this meeting that are living in disobedience, 
that they'll stand at gaze at the one who was obedient unto death. Lord, if there's areas in our life like Satan himself where we want the preeminence and we want the praise and we want the eulogy, we pray, Lord, this morning that you will, oh, bring us to the cross and slay that capital I. And may we be men and women that will be marked by godly humility, that will not try to outdo one another, not try to outdo one another in our families, or not try to outdo one another and put others down, but, oh, as a congregation, we would bend low and bow low before a holy God. And we thank you that you will exalt us in due time. We pray that thou part us now with thy fear and with thy blessing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let me say again, if you're going, please go quietly and let us remember the Lord. Thank you.